We have with us from Houston right now uh, Defense Attorney Christopher Bebel, uh, who uh, uh, has been kind enough to step in front of a camera there. And I just wonder, just initially, your thoughts, uh, surprised at the, uh, the conviction or not? No, I don't think the conviction is surprising. But you have to remember, this is not the type of case the government wants to bring to trial. This was a cliffhanger. This was a close call because Sullivan was largely uncorroborated and because Bernie Evers made it difficult by buying so much stock after he had been discharged in 2002. What, what, what do you mean? He didn't buy stock, I don't believe, Chris, but he owned a great deal. He owned about 27 million shares even after. He never really sold, which was one of the interesting things. He did use it and pledge it uh, against certain loans, remember, and that left Bank America on the hook for a lot. Ultimately, WorldCom said they would uh, take care of that because they didn't want him being a big seller. But it always was a big question out there. He never benefited personally in terms of selling the stock when it was at or near highs while the fraud was going on. Though. Even though he was able to guarantee it for those loans. He, so he was, was and, use he, it in that and way. he did use it for buying right. property, but he was still relying on the stock Mr. itself. Mr. Bebel, would you have put Bernie Evers on the stand? That was a big mistake yeah. on the part of the defense. One of the things you have to remember in this kind of case, this is not sexy. This doesn't have people sitting on the edge of their chairs. This is dull, mundane minutiae that comes in waves. There, there are piles and piles of documents. When Evers was seated for cross-examination, the prosecutors were able to hone in on some of the items that created the most exposure for Bernie Ebers. Among those things were the budget line reports that, that showed uh, the line costs dropping from about $1.6 billion per month in October and November to about half that, about $850 million. And then in the first quarter of the next year, Ebers was asked about that. Ebers was ever stated that he went and threw these records in the trash. As a result, that helps support a verdict based upon willful blindness. The willful blindness instruction was very key. D looking ahead, as we were discussing earlier, the, to the Enron trial, will this make it more difficult for a Ken Lay or a Jeff Skilling, most especially, I guess, Ken Lay, to, to make the same claims, that he just didn't know what was going on in his own company? It's difficult for people to make the claims they didn't know what is going on in their company when their statements are being recorded at quarterly uh, conferences with analysts and uh, during uh, appearances before the media. One of the things that was played here before the jury was the CNBC appearance yeah. by Mr. Ebers that occurred in February 2002, where he specifically stated that the accounting practices employed by the company were conservative, very conservative. You know, that makes it difficult for him to say he didn't know anything about anything. And Tyler, that was your interview, and, and uh, you know, it, it brought up the issue of CEOs and, and what they say publicly. They're always trying to put the positive spin on their companies, and you know, whether that was what Mr. Evers was doing and in his duty as a CEO or whether he was just lying. That's right. And at that point, of course, which was pre-Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, uh, we didn't have CEOs and CFOs vouching uh, for the accuracy of their financial statements in qu quite the same way uh, that we do right now. And at that point, uh, we were all uh, sort of uh, fiddling around in the darkness, feeling around in the darkness because while there were whiffs of uh, concern there about how the accounting was being done, we really didn't know very much, and we didn't know much until uh, about a year and a half, uh, a year or more later, uh, when this whole thing in June, uh, as David Faber broke that one evening, that memorable evening in June of that year, uh, when this whole thing came tumbling down. But at that point, he was very, very uh, uh, strong stout in defending uh, the accounting practices of his company. He said there was nothing to worry about, uh, that everything was was fine. I also remember, just apropos something uh, uh, in an interview that I did with him a, a couple of years before, 
This was a guy who, through his uh, business career, had been a details-oriented fellow. Yep. I remember him distinctly telling me that uh, when he was in the motel business, he'd started with some Hampton Inns or uh, something down there in, in Mississippi, uh, he was the kind of guy who went and counted the rolls of toilet paper in the rooms, counted the bars of soap. So this was a guy who, at least at one point in his career, was certainly oriented towards uh, keeping a, a very close track of where the money was going and how. You know, uh, Tyler, I remember that interview. I believe his quote was, uh, I cleaned a commode if I had to. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. And, uh, and you know, Bill, it's funny, when I saw him, now that's already two years ago, I believe it was, um, uh, he had been working mowing the lawn for one of his motels that he still owned right before he ran into me in town. He had grass stains on his shirt. You know, this is a uh, guy who returned to, and never really left, to sort of somewhat humble, although he did live in a very big house in town, but never left Brook Brookhaven, Mississippi. And it was interesting, even though all the people there, many of whom had invested in the company, lost yeah. everything, they didn't really uh, have a great deal of uh, enmity for, uh, for Mr. Everett. Mr. Bevel, let me ask you, just trying to read between the lines of the uh, statement that our Scott Cohen read from Reed Weingarten, that uh, maybe an appeal will come from them based on the, uh, the immunity granted to some of the uh, prosecution witnesses there from the company. Uh, is that a, a valid appeal in your view in this case? I don't think the defense is likely to have this overturned on appeal uh, based on uh, any accusations that uh, the prosecutors or the judge acted improperly with respect to uh, granting immunity to government witnesses or not granting immunity to witnesses uh, the defense called. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that uh, the, the companion civil lawsuit had the effect of muzzling uh, numerous bystanders. Um, th there were c statements by Ebers uh, on cross-examination that he doesn't ever recall meeting three, four times uh, a week with Sullivan standing alone uh, or sitting alone in, in their office. There's numerous other people that could have maybe weighed in on that and, and uh, rebutted that. All those people, though, are hesitant to speak up and come forward uh, because of, of the civil lawsuits uh, even that, that, they, that could impact them even if immunity is granted. This was a very difficult environment in which to try the case. I don't think the, the appellate court is going to touch it. I think it's solid. It stays intact. Uh, Chris, Mr. Uh, Sorry, Scott. I just, uh, Go ahead. Can I just, I just wanted to ask Chris a quick, a quick question, if I could. Uh, we've just gotten a little more insight on what they plan on, uh, uh, on the grounds for potential appeal. And we're going to bring you the full uh, comments from Reed Weingarten in just a moment. But uh, the other issue is, um, the other issue is uh, venue. They wanted this tried in Mississippi, and that was denied. This case obviously tried here in New York. Uh, and so that apparently will be another issue on appeal, that and the whole immunity question. Does they have a leg to stand on on the, on the venue question. Not really. There were multiple places where this case could have been tried. When you have a large international company, there are places, numerous places around the United States that this could have been tried. Uh, the Attorney General of Oklahoma would have had uh, jurisdiction and venue to try this case. Uh, this, th th there's going to be no way that uh, that uh, this will be reversed based on the fact that it was tried in New York. Th this company uh, was uh, traded on the exchanges. Uh, th there were numerous purchases and sales taking place in New York on a daily basis. Uh, I'm talking about uh, transactions in the securities of WorldCom. This was clearly uh, uh, a, a situation where proper venue lied in New York. What else did you hear from uh, Mr. Weingarten there, Scott? Is that what you're coming back from? That, that was the main thing, uh, and again, we're going to get you that tape in a moment. Uh, the other thing I w I, I'm wondering if we can get Chris to weigh in on is the broader issue here uh, on the war on corporate crime. We know there's going to be an Enron case coming up the first of next year. They have to be breathing a huge sigh of relief at the Justice Department that they got this conviction uh, despite the so-called aw shucks defense, uh, that they can now continue in this in this effort to rein in some of these CEOs, correct? Well, th that's right. The 
Department of Justice has to be very happy here. The, if you look back in time, you remember that the Department of Justice investigated and investigated and investigated this thing. The, the government was very hesitant to bring charges. Finally, it was pretty much forced into bringing charges, uh, and it was uh, the, the Oklahoma Attorney General's office uh, forced DOJ's hand in that regard. The government went forward. It did its best. It, it corroborated Sullivan's testimony a little bit with uh, Sullivan's voicemail message, with the uh, statements of Myers, uh, wherein uh, Bernie Evers supposedly po apologized uh, uh, about uh, lower-level people being forced to make these accounting entries. Uh, the government also uh, uh, put into the mix uh, Bernie Evers' statements on CNBC. Uh, in February 2002, where he uh, uh, proclaimed to have knowledge of uh, the accounting tendencies of the firm and, and labeled them as conservative. All those things added up uh, to, to uh, give the government enough evidence to, uh, to obtain a conviction. It's not the kind of case the government wants to bring to trial, but the government feels that when it can win this kind of case, when, when it can bring a case that is this thin and still uh, obtain an <coughs> overwhelming victory, that is a very positive sign. It's going, to, it's going to scare some of the people who are on the fence, uh, such as in the Enron broadband trial that's going to be coming up, uh, I believe it's April 18th, right. into cooperating, and the snowball is going to grow larger. The, the government's uh, uh, hand will go uh, will grow stronger as uh, as time goes on all right now as we said uh, mr. Ebers himself left as you saw the uh, the courthouse without speaking to reporters but his attorney uh, the celebrated Reed Weingarten did speak with the reporters a short time ago and here's what he said I'm extremely disappointed I know mr. Ebers and I know the evidence in this case and I was extremely hopeful that he would be vindicated and I uh, the, the fight continues and if he obviously wasn't vindicated today um, because I think the system works right I expect them to be vindicated in the future after some of the errors made in the trial are remedied in the post trial process are there any things that you might have done differently given the outcome I'm a notorious second guesser particularly in connection with my own performance I'll do that enough down the road Absolutely, CEOs have a responsibility, uh, but it doesn't mean they've committed crimes when misdeeds were uh, committed in their organizations that they didn't know about. The captain of the ship is responsible for the ship, but he's not criminally responsible unless he acted with criminal intent. And I didn't think Mr. Evers ever acted with criminal intent, and still don't today, despite the verdict. Take to put him on the stand. Uh, I guess history will decide that. I didn't think it, I didn't think it was a hard call at the time, and I'm sure I would do it again today had I been had I been presented with the same situation. Reed, how quickly can we expect an appeal in terms of filing? Get a sense. You know, I, I, um, when it's mandated, you'll you'll get it. Reed, will you ask if you remain out pending appeal? The, uh, the jury, the, excuse me, the judge released him today, so the, the bond continues. Mr. Evers will be going home today. But He'll be going home to surrender Mr. date? Uh, when she opposes the surrender date, are you going to ask that he be allowed to stay out past that? Oh, uh, naturally, and I think because the appellate issues are important, I'm expecting it will be granted. Do you was think he was surprised that... Was there anything in the trial that you thought was particularly hurtful to your side? Well, I, obviously Scott Sullivan testified for five days, and he incriminated Mr. Evers for five days, and that was not a pleasant process to endure as a defense counsel, but I actually thought we effectively dealt with it on cross-examination. Had the jury simply bought Scott Sullivan, they would have convicted him the first day. Eight days later, they obviously were considering other issues. I, I, it's, it would be interesting to know what, in fact, they did decide the case upon. Were you stunned that it was a verdict across all counts? No, I think this, was, this, one, this one was obviously all or nothing. So the fact that they convicted on all counts uh, followed from the way the case was charged. So it would have been all up or all down. I, I'm, it'll be going home. I'm not certain exactly when. <laughs> Can you comment on Bernie's demeanor and feeling as the days went on and, you know, day four, five, and six? Obviously, it was an ordeal, and I would prefer not to go blow by blow. A very difficult situation for anyone, including for him. What about the length of the jury deliberation? I'm sure it was a diligent group of people who did their best, and they wrestled with very difficult, complex evidence. 
uh, unfortunately, they came out the wrong way. And again, on, on the appeal, what do you see as, as the most critical issue? I, I, again, I think the jury was deprived of important evidence when, they, when the government refused to immunize uh, critical executives at WorldCom. The jury should have heard that evidence. What are the other uh, there were seven or eight important pretrial issues. Uh, I mean, I think it would be tedious and complex to go through all of them. It, just check the record and you'll see. One or two? I, I think venue should have been changed. I think this case should have been tried in Mississippi. I think all the important witnesses and evidence in WorldCom obviously were in Mississippi. Uh, that was an important issue. Were there witnesses you would have liked to call other than the three you mentioned? Uh, obviously, we have subpoena power and we made tactical decisions, but the three were critical. Okay. And obviously uh, flustered, a bit crestfallen, uh, Reed Weingarten, not a uh, demeanor that we're used to seeing from uh, a very self-confident prosecutor. If you've just joined us, or defense attorney, rather, you've just joined us, uh, Bernard Ebers, the uh, former CEO of WorldCom, has been found guilty on all counts against him, including conspiracy to commit securities fraud, securities fraud, and making false statements. Uh, in, in those uh, filings. Uh, back with Christopher Bevel, uh, the defense attorney in Houston. Uh, uh, tough to watch uh, Reed Weingarten. I mean, I'm sure you've been there, too, in, in cases. Uh, uh, I don't know what your record is, but uh, he's not used to losing in cases like this. Well, he, he's a good lawyer. He has a good record. Uh, I, I think the biggest judgment call they had to make was whether or not to put Bernie Ebers on the stand. The The thing that is not being said that must have undoubtedly entered their minds is that Scott Sullivan held up better than, than uh, they had expected. As a result, they had to take a chance and put Bernie Ebers on the stand. If Scott Sullivan had been destroyed and twisted into a pretzel, the defense team would have felt a lot more confident about bringing the trial to a close as quickly as possible and putting this in the hands of the jury. But because Sullivan hung in there, and these are some of the intangibles that are hard to gauge from a distance. It, 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 it depends on the chemistry and the demeanor and the eye contact and, and yeah. so on. Uh, all those intangibles combined so as to uh, make Scott Sullivan a appear as more credible than they had anticipated, that's what prompted them to put Bernie Ebers on the stand, and that's what ended up costing them the trial. Let me just point out, we're going to try and hit our break here near the top of the hour, so let me just get a final comment from uh, each of our uh, sort of panel members that we've been talking to. Uh, David, you've been going through your, your files there uh, as the... Uh, Keep them statements for were being reason. made there, Keep yes. For a reason to, uh, you know, it does remind me of the dominance that this company once had in terms of in the investment community. Of course, this was during the bubble, but WorldCom was at one point the most highly valued of all the telecommunications companies in this country. And that man right there was celebrated throughout on magazine covers and lots of other places as one of the great chief executives in this country. And uh, he had a great deal of, uh, well, you know, braggadocio. He certainly um, played the part and played that role to the hilt at many times. And Tyler, you know, a lot of the questions uh, were often about all the acquisitions that uh, WorldCom was making through the years and how they were being accounted for. It was something like six dozen different acquisitions uh, through which he built that uh, WorldCom MCI empire. This man, a Canadian, uh, a former milkman, basketball coach, really a... Uh, came up right from, as David points out, the bootstraps, uh, a hard-working guy. And uh, whatever you think of the fraud, uh, it is, a, once again, one of these American parables of, of people who fly very high and, uh, and take very hard falls. And Scott Cohn, I mean, uh, when all is said and done, uh, as Christopher Bebel said, you know, it was kind of a squeaker uh, for it to come down to, and uh, the jury found in the prosecution's favor. Well, which, which goes to uh, the, the just superior lawyering on both sides, I suppose. Uh, it, was a, it was a tough case, and for a lot of the reasons that, that Tyler was just alluding to, what a, what a stunning rise and stunning fall for Bernie Ebers, uh, someone who had put this company together really without any formal training in accounting, 
and then had to get the jury to believe that he didn't pick it up along the way. The jury didn't buy that. Uh, they bought what Scott Sullivan had to say, even though Scott Sullivan was an admitted liar, among other things. So uh, it was a very tough case, which is evidenced by the fact that it took them eight days to decide it. But beyond that, and very quickly here, Mr. Bebel, I'll let you have the last word. Uh, many people felt justice was not being served, not just in the WorldCom case, but in others as well, given the amount of time it took for the discovery process and bringing a lot of these tri trials to, uh, to trial, these cases to trial. It's better to, to measure twice and cut once. The, the government needs to put a lot of legwork into these in order to win. And when the government brings in these kind of cases, and gets the guilty verdicts, it has a tremendous deterrent effect across the country. The old saying among prosecutors is, indict in haste, repent at leisure. That did not occur here. Gentlemen, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, maybe we'll ask you to stand by here. We're gonna take our break here. Melissa and I will continue with the coverage of the, uh, the conviction today of Bernard Evers, the former CEO of WorldCom, after these messages. Bring uh, defense attorney Christopher Bevel back in. He's joining us uh, today from Houston. And uh, one thing we haven't talked with you about is jury selection and uh, our Scott Cohn itemizing uh, some of the uh, the people who sat on that jury and uh, their level of education and their professions. Uh, uh, could that have been a a weak link for uh, Reed Weingarten in this trial as well? Well, th there's a number of things that go into uh, picking a jury here. And a, a lot of times the, the pool as a whole is unfavorable. So you end up with a, a, a panel that you don't like. But on the other hand, you're complimenting yourself because you did a pretty darn good job of, um, of ferreting out the, the people who would have been even worse here. Now, in, in this kind of situation where you have uh, a, a lot of jurors who uh, who uh, are not going to be on top of accounting nuances. Um, they're going to look, and, and they have never seen anybody who has even uh, enjoyed one hundredth of the uh, net worth that Mr. Ebers had enjoyed, and, and uh, uh, they're going to uh, they're going to have some envy over uh, the lifestyle he maintained with his big yacht and uh, the big ranch and uh, and. Uh, Canada and so on, and, and that that's gonna that's going to come into the equation, even though they won't acknowledge it, even though they do their best to uh, to subtract it from their thought process. Um, here, I think one of the the big things was was that uh, they heard early on some uh, testimony that put uh, Mr. Ebers in an unfavorable light. Uh, such as uh, uh, counting the, the coffee filters, such as putting the regular uh, tap water into the, uh, the, the spring water, uh, uh, whatever that is, the, the big bottle of uh, Ozarka water, and, and saying that uh, the employees didn't notice a difference. Uh, little things like that put Ebers in a, in a very distasteful light. It makes it easier to get uh, uh, guilty verdicts and then when you have uh, documents that are taken out of uh, Mr. Ebers office and they have lots of uh, uh, handwritten uh, notations on it, uh, highlighting uh, and, and, and so on, um, you, you see that uh, Mr. Ebers uh, did review uh, budget reports and line item reports talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Line expenses being at about $1.6 billion per month in October and November 2000, then dropping to about half that. Mr. Ebers throwing uh, the, uh, the documents for the next quarter into the trash. Mr. Ebers uh, uh, making statements to David Myers about uh, how, how sorry he was that uh, lower level accounting people had to make these entries. Mr. Ebers uh, uh, appearing on CNBC and uh, characterizing the uh, accounting as uh, conservative and then to top it off you look at the 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 enormous uh, salary and stock options uh, the company stepping in to guarantee loans on his behalf right. and, and they think how can a guy like this who is in, who is making so much money off this company 
um, just serve as, as a coach and a cheerleader. It doesn't add up, it doesn't work, we're not buying it, and that's what happened here. And so the blue collar mentality right. probably made it easier to reject Ebers' defense. Mr. Bevel, we got, we got to take a break, but we do have full team coverage of the Ebers, of the Bernie Ebers verdict right here on Power Lunch, so stay tuned. How do you think, uh, what, what kinds of notes do you think Ken Lay's defense attorneys are taking uh, now that we've seen the outcome of, of the Bernie Ebers trial and uh, his defense? Chris, how about you? Well, I, I, I think first of all, uh, Ken Lay and, and many other executives uh, well into the future are going to have to rely on this kind of uh, defense. Uh, th th they're going to have to say, I really didn't know what was going on. Yeah, I may have signed off on something, I may not have signed off on something, but how can someone who is uh, presiding over multi-billion dollar international operations be on top of all the nooks and crannies? You can't. Uh, and, and therefore, you combine that, that element of lack of, of uh, knowledge of the details, uh, you, you try and portray yourself as uh, having minimal uh, grasp of, of accounting concepts, and then you rest the heart and soul of your case on intent or the lack thereof. Yeah, things may have gone wrong, things may look bad, there may have been mistakes and oversights, but there was no criminal intent, and that's the intangible that will always make these trials a real horse race. David, we haven't heard much from you, and I have a minute before we have to take this next break. Uh, just your thoughts on what the weak link was in, uh, in the uh, Reed Weingarten uh, defense of Bernie Ebers here, do you think? Well, he obviously had a very difficult choice in deciding to put Ebers on the stand. Uh, it's one of the toughest choices criminal defense lawyers have. And unfortunately for him, the jury did not believe Ebers they did believe Scott Sullivan, uh, much of whose testimony was uncorroborated. You'll remember many of the uh, meetings were just one-on-one -on -one meetings with him and Ebers. And so the bottom line is that the jury believed Sullivan. They did not believe Ebers. So the risk in putting him on uh, backfired. It didn't work. All right, gentlemen, we'll take a break here. We will ask you to stand by. We've got the rest of our panel members standing by as well. We'll continue to talk about the... Uh, how much the possibility of their appeal, uh, how, many, how much it has legs in this case. We sort of got a hint from Reed Weingarten what the appeal might be. We'll talk about that when we come back after this. Back with some final thoughts from our panel members as we discuss the, uh, uh, the conviction today of Bernard Evers on all counts against him in his uh, securities fraud trial. Uh, let me start with the attorneys that have been with us this hour. We thank you for your, your time with us. Uh, Chris Bebel, uh, very simply, was justice served in this trial? Yes, I think justice was served, and the prosecutors are to be commended for taking on this challenge. It was a tough case. What they did is they they went the extra mile and cobbled together numerous bits and pieces of information to support their case. They joined that together with Scott Sullivan's testimony and it was enough to convince the jury of Ebers' guilt. Right. They are deserving of accolades.